Okay, hello everyone and welcome to listen to our talk about Lumi supercomputer. My name is Katri and I work as a manager there at the Center for Scientific Computing in Finland. And in my unit we have this uh, geoinformatics group also, um, because we don't only provide infra, we also like to enhance it with geoinformatics tools and, and data, so that it's not like cold infra only. Um, little bit about CESC. So we are owned by the Finnish state and the higher education institutes and uh, yeah, like I said, we are not like a research institute. We like to provide you with this info, uh, infra and uh, the geoinformatics tools and, and, and data and then we just see what you researchers do. Um, and yeah, here you can see Lumi is the white dot up there in the north, Kajani. And then the countries with dark color, they are the uh, Lumi Consortium countries. And then the, the lighter gray is the European Union. So it's a joint undertaking. And Kajani was uh, selected because it's in the north and it's cold and it's easy to, to cool down the, the machine. Um, this is how it looks like from outside. Maybe not so impressive, but uh, it's maybe it's just nice to see how it is. And this is the actual Lumi. So it's a huge, uh, like, huge machine with rows of, of iron. Um, it's the fifth fastest supercomputer globally. It used to be the third fastest, but now I think US has gone further. And uh, this snowflake uh, emits, I wanted to snow. So Lumi actually means snow in, in Finnish and also I heard in Estonian. Uh, but so if you start from uh, 11 o'clock, so you have this uh, Lumi C partition of uh, CPU cores, but actually Lumi is mostly a GPU machine. So if you work with machine learning, it's, it's the machine for you. Then we have a partition for data analytics, um, flash-based storage layer. Then we have Lustre, parallel file system. And then at 6 o'clock, the Lumi object storage. So it's uh, where you can store your data during the project lifetime. Um, then there is also partition for QPUs, which I've heard are used also for, for CO um, research and uh, Lumi K container cloud service. And now I will uh, hand over to Kylli. Yes, hello, I'm Kylli Ek. I'm, I'm also from CSC, but I have actually graduated from this house, so happy to be back. Uh, maybe one small correction, this quantum part of Lumi will be in Czech Republic and not in Kajani. But basically, the and it will be quantum, so for those who know what is quantum, they know that's quite different. So we don't talk about Lumiku today at all. Um, but I think many of you have used some cloud computers, but then this Lumi supercomputer is quite a different thing. As Katri showed the pictures, it is one huge machine. And if with uh, virtual machines, you get the whole virtual machine for yourself, then with supercomputer, you usually ask for some tiny, tiny part of it. And all the users are using the same machine, so there is just one of them. And um, let's see the slides. <laughs> so, as Katri said, it's mostly a GPU machine with uh, a lot of GPUs. So, that is um, from GS, I will come back to the software that you can use, but it's mostly for deep learning cases. But it has also CPU, so you can run the more usual software there also. And one thing with the supercomputers is that there is huge amounts of memory available. So if you need something where you need one terabyte of memory, it's not a mistake, then there it is possible. I think you can never find such virtual machine where that would be possible. And there is also quite a lot of storage. As Katri already said, there is different options, but the local storage in in Lumi, that is up to 500 terabytes that you can have there locally. And when talking about the use cases, then because it's so much a GPU machine, then deep learning projects come first. 
And the bigger the model you are developing, the more you should think about Lumi. And mostly at the moment, they, there is this big language models that they run there. But there are already a few spatial data projects also ongoing. What we know are from Finland, but we don't know all the statistics, so there might be somebody else also. And uh, also, basically, any data analysis, that if it takes days or weeks for you, then you could consider moving it to a supercomputer. It depends a lot what kind it is, but in, in many cases it could be used. But it is not a web service. You cannot put any web service up there. That is one thing that I think in many projects people would like, that there is some nice web front and then something is happening in the background. So that is not possible with Lumi at the moment, at least. And also because the way it works, nothing time critical can be done there, because you never know how long it takes that even your st work starts. So it might be like days in queue be before anything starts. So that's why such time critical things don't work. Uh, I put here one example case from ISI that has been using now Lumi for a while. Uh, I don't know if here's people who don't know, ISI is a Finnish, it was a startup, but I think it has grown too big <laughs> nowadays. But anyway, they have a lot of satellites for SAR data globally. And because the real visit time is very short, then the applications often are about floods and wildfires and things that happen quite fast. And to detect these things from their images, they use a lot of deep learning models. They have really a lot of people and a lot of models, and they, they now do their model training in Lumi. The actual use of mo these models in their case happens elsewhere because, but the model training is the one usually that takes a lot of computing power, and that they do now in Lumi, and they have been pretty happy there because Earlier they said that when they were using a commercial cloud, they might ha happen that the GPUs were not even available because they wanted so many. But because Lumi has so many GPUs, so then the availability has been good. And what they liked especially was that the data was close to the GPUs, so they didn't. I think when, in commercial clouds, they were always m like starting up a new virtual machine, moving the data to there, and then doing the analysis. So now they can keep the data kind of all the time there and then do that model training as needed. And also, uh, Katri comes back to the costs and stuff. In most cases, it's actually free of charge, but in Finland, for companies, it costs. <laughs> but anyway, they said it's much cheaper than the commercial options. And one thing that also differs us from the co uh, com commercial clouds is that we, Lumi has a special team of support, it, because it was from 11 countries, so there is one person from each of the countries. Plus from CSU, I am in this backup <laughs> support team. So that there is another 10 persons maybe who, who help also with more specific questions. So because I think in commercial clouds, they never help you with actually how to run and how to install, and it's all, always your own worry. So there is people to ask help for. Um, but then I think for many, the supercomputer might be a new thing. So how, how it works is basically you need to have scripts. If you're used to Kugis or Arkis, then it's difficult. <laughs> but the scripts basically can be almost anything. The most common ones that we have seen are Python, R, maybe some bash scripts. And uh, we have Kugis there installed, but it, that is mainly, it was a deep learning project that asked to see their results. So usually don't use Kugis actually for the analysis, but technically it is possible to use pure Kugis for doing the stuff, but I don't think that many people use that. And then in supercomputers, everything works via such batch jobs that you have the scripts that you run and then you have a short extra script that defines how many computing resources you need, cores or GPUs and memory and stuff, and then you put it to the queue and that was the place where it might start immediately, but might take some time. And also you must, that is often difficult that you must uh, say in advance how long it might take. But you can always put a little bit extra, so that is not so bad. And then one important thing to get actually things done fast in, in supercomputers is that it, 
the code must run in parallel in, in a way or another. If you run a usual one core Python and R script, it's as fast in supercomputer as in a local laptop. There is no magic. People sometimes think that, oh, it's a supercomputer, it will be super fast. But just moving it there, it doesn't make it really <coughs> super fast. And then we have some tools already installed to Lumi. I think for deep learning projects, there is both PyTorch and Keras. I think these cover most of the cases. Uh, from GIS tools, there is a few ones installed, but it could be the list a lot longer. We have kind of decided that we install when somebody asks. So I put here also the list that we have in another national computer that to what only Finns have access. But these tools we have installed to national computer and it should be possible also in Lumi. Uh, even the saga that was here in the previous session, I think I don't have it on the list, but that is also possible. <laughs> but basically most, most, most cases use Python and R. The, all the other such but also these other tools, they can be used sometimes via R, sometimes via Python or then command line. So basically anything that can be installed to Linux, open source is very good, licensing always cause trouble, especially in supercomputers because it's not one computer. So you must have floating license if you have a commercial tool. And if it's a GPU tool, then in Lumi case, it must be from AMD GPU because that is what it is. Uh, what is not possible at all is anything Windows only. So ArcGIS, for example, we have in the national computer the ArcGIS Python API, but that's it. But the ArcPy even is not possible because the licensing goes in a way that's not possible. And also anything with this, that is a server, uh, APIs, databases, these are not possible. And in Lumi case, many projects want to do their own installations because they might have very specific versions and stuff what they want to do. So anything that is Conda or pip based or Docker based should be very easy. There is a special tool for that. Or if there is people who have used supercomputers elsewhere, then this Aptainus easy build and spec could be familiar. So these are also supported. And there is also such ready-made uh, Python environment, so if you need just a few ones extra, then that is also possible to just extend them. Uh, Lumi has also a web interface, so, but mostly working with Lumi means that you are in this Linux box, and my kids call it alien box. So, so it re requires a little bit of Linux skill to <coughs> skills to, to use a supercomputer, but this web interface makes it possible to some of the tasks make easy, but yeah. So I would say mostly people use Jupyter in this web interface, or then from the, via desktop, this Kugis or Crass or Sagagis. Or then also for the, no, I lost. Oh. I, or if in, in case of, uh, Deep learning, then this tensor board, of course, can be of interest also. And then also there is Visual Studio Code for actually writing the code there. Um, and then how to make the code parallel, because many of the GIS tools don't support it. And that's kind of the biggest problem. If you come from chemistry or some molecular biology, then there's a lot of tools that do it for you, and you don't have to really think about it. But in GIS case, mostly you have to think about it. I put here a few Python and R libraries that have at least something in parallel. But even, for example, in, in Terra case in R, it's only a few functions that go in parallel. Mostly it's not. And then the reality is that you have to do it yourself. There is, again, both in Python and R, several libraries that can be used. In R, I would recommend to use the future library. In Python, there are several good ones. I think Dask is nowadays maybe the first one. It's not the easiest, but it has a lot of options. But even if you don't want to go paralyzing the, your code, then there is also extra tools. To, for example, if you want to run many 
many files, then you can kind of do ex external parallelization. So there is the GNU parallel order is also special tools like SnakeMake and Nextflow. I don't believe anybody has ever heard of them, but but anyway, there is many options to to do to make your code parallel, and it's not always even so complicated. So how goes the usual use case? So the first thing is to get access and user accounts. Katri comes back to that still. And then you must open this alien box and log, log in. And moving data, if you know how to move data to a Linux machine, then exactly the same. It is, it's kind of a Linux machine, but just a huge one. <laughs> so, so like basically all this login and moving data, this for Linux users should be familiar. And then you come to the installation parts. There is good documentation about it. So, and you can always ask help. This installation is maybe the main thing where you should ask for help because, especially in Lumi, there are some few tricks and tra things that could be done. And, and people who work with Lumi every day, they know them very well. And then the next thing is to, to write this batch job that was for, for sending it to the system. That would be, but this batch job, it is like 10 rows. So that shouldn't be too difficult. If you see a few examples, then you get. And also, that will also come back, but we have courses about that also. And then basically you sit in the queue and you get some results and very likely first time you get some error, but just keep trying. <laughs> so, and then you can see how it went. Usually you start with some test data and then you run the actual data. And Lumi has a lot of documentation, so you can see it from there also. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we are running out of time, so, so I can just say that um, we have a bunch of uh, these links here on how to get started. You can apply through EuroHPC EU or uh, through your own country for resources. And there is 20% uh, research for companies. Yeah. Um, one fun, fun story that I forgot to tell you earlier is that, you know, this Lumi excess heat is used to, to, to heat up city of Kajaani, some of it. And then when they build it, it was of course late because all the big infra projects are always late. So then they had this really hard deadline that if you don't deliver by this date, then the city, uh, the people in Kajaani will have cold showers. So then they, yeah, really, but they, they made it in time. But yeah, we have this uh, bunch of links and then you can contact us and, and get more information about how to get started. And uh, there is about training and uh, more about Lumi in general. So just contact us and we can send you this presentation. Mm. Oh, and the, yeah, the conference page. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's good to see Snake Make there. We, we use it uh, very uh, often. Um, some questions from the room? Yeah, thank you very much. I was uh, quite pleasantly surprised how Lumi uh, is uh, friendly. Uh, and uh, I saw uh, multiple uh, package managers are supported for installation. Did you uh, did you consider to support Nix as well? Uh, uh, Nix package manager, like like if you don't know what I'm talking, then then uh, yeah, you didn't. Thank you. Yeah, let's say that it was not us who decided. It was the international team of people. So that's. Usually, supercomputer have either this easy build or spec, but because they couldn't agree, they put both. <laughs> but yeah, I think these are the four options that there is. Oh, like building from source is the fifth, of course. Uh, yes, you had uh, the example of uh, ISI, but how widely Lumi is used by GIS industry in general? Not yet, <laughs> but there is opportunity. I see it's the only, only use case. <laughs> I think it's the only commercial use case. There is some academic projects, but, All right. 
but the, it has been also historically in Finland that the companies have not had access to supercomputers because the national ones, because we are this ministry owned company, then we cannot sell them. But this Lumi is now the first time that companies even have possibility. I don't know, I think also in other countries it has been quite limited for companies to get access, but now, uh, now there really is possibility for companies and even for public administration, I think. It's not written here, but for this Europe HPC G GU part, companies, academia and public administration can apply for. And it, the, this Europe HPC side is always for free. The countries can have their own rules. I know that Estonia, for example, is asking for money both from academia and companies. Finland is asking only from companies. <laughs> so it's, it's very, I, we didn't go through all the 11 countries how they have their rules. More questions? So just to thank you very much. I have a lot of, uh, uh, so let me finish my sentence and then I'll give it to you. I uh, have a huge respect to the maintainers of the supercomputers. There's this story of one university where a maintainer went away and her job had to be replaced by five others. <laughs> so, Luis. Uh, I'm, let's see if I can synthesize this. So he, we're talking here about distributed computing, which is very different from what most, I would say, researchers are expecting. Uh, I see that you have some, tra some training options, but how is it going? Do you have people attending this training? Is it, is it provided as a service? Because I think that's really the key to get something like Lumi going to the long term. Okay, I have forgotten, but we actually will have a course in October. It has option to come to Espo, or you can participate remotely and it's free of charge for everybody. Um, how, how long? How many days? Two days. Mm -hmm. um, so people are not allowed <laughs> there. <laughs> Take the opportunity. So search for CSC and Kio Computing course, you will find it with Google. I think not any of these links actually take you there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, just use that for coffee break. It's a really good opportunity. Like if you are stuck with your stuff, then you just go there and ask. And by the way, feel free to use the mailing list of the OSGO Foundation to announce this kind of, of training. I think that's fine. Thank you very much for attending. So.